to worship comes from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. give thanks. O oh, Holy God, we come to your house of worship this morning so grateful to be here at First Church. We thank you, Lord, for this church and all the churches where you have put your name. And we thank you that you are with us during this time of wondering what is going on with our health. And Lord, we just ask you to be with us and walk with us and talk with us as we go through this pandemic. Keep us safe and all our loved ones and those that are suffering, may they have your peace, your shalom, and that they will be well. We thank you for the uncertainty of the times as well, which lends to the the thought that our society is actually what we are. So it's a call to an alarm from you 
that we need to draw closer to you. And Lord, we are willing for you to give us direction on how to live our lives in you. We thank you, too, for the love that you have for us, and we can feel it as we come together as your body. But Lord, we know, too, the danger of uh, the pandemic, so we are cautious in that. We never felt that we would be in this type of situation, so we ask for your guidance. We ask for your discernment through your Holy Spirit that, that will let us know what is right and what is wrong for our neighbor as well as ourselves. Again, Lord, accept our praises this Sabbath morning and we thank the elders of First Church for coming together and wanting to streamline these worship services again at this time to hear the mighty word of God, which is living and active and sharp as a sword. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. May your words go forth and not come back empty to you in each one of us. This we say in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We just want to thank the elders of First Church for wanting to continue these um, live streaming uh, worship services that uh, we can worship as his body, although we're not together. I know it's a rough time on each of us. We, we're social beings and to be quarantined and isolated is hard on us. We um, are always visiting each other. We enjoy meals around the table together and we haven't done this for a long time. However, we do pray for each other. Our prayers have grown and so that makes us much closer to our Lord. But we need to pray in, uh, against this uh, pandemic and name it and rebuke it in Jesus' name. Again, this is the first church in Kamyai, P.O. Box 1. If you would like to make any kind of donations to the ongoing worship, please do so. If you would like to make uh, donations to Second Church, you can send it to this address and put Second Church on it, and we will make sure that it gets there. We are uh, grateful for this decision again to come to you through this live streaming. I'd like to offer a pastoral prayer now. It will be general. And I uh, just know that you've got uh, situations on your, your heart that um, need prayer. So I'll give you a little silence in the middle of it to, to offer your prayers to him. Our Heavenly Father, we come to your throne of grace this morning. Some of our hearts are heavy because of losses in the family or sickness, sickness with friends, relatives. Lord, we know that um, our life here is short, but we have an eternal home with you. We ask, Lord, that you you lead us through this time and that we would hear your voice in our silence as we pray. We know that uh, for some reason this is happening and sometimes we think we have wandered too far from you as a people. We have not trusted you. We think of the Israelites in the wilderness or you put them so that they would have to depend upon you 
and maybe this is what you are doing with us. We need to call out to you, cry out to you, and you will hear us, Lord. We are your children. Just like you chose the Israelites as a chosen race, you have made us the people, the Nimipu, the people. But our neighbors are very special to you as well. You have made us all. We are yours. And we cry out to you now to hear our prayer, Lord, and give us um, the resurrected life that that we have in our salvation, that we know that we, we died in our sins with Christ on the cross, and we are now living a life that he is our living Savior, sitting at your right hand. We offer this time of silence for each one to offer their prayers to you in this particular prayer. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Accept our praises this morning as we do love you because you first loved us. And we thank you for the scriptures that we will hear. We say this in your name, Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Lord our brother, and our friend. Amen. We will have a hymn, a short hymn. gospel reading comes from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22, starting at 34. It's entitled, The Greatest Commandments. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. First, we need to pay homage to the words of Jesus Christ. No one has ever spoken like Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke simply, but with greater wisdom and authority than any other person who walked this earth. The disciples were constantly amazed at what he said. Jesus claims his words and his warnings are immense, ringing with power and authority and majesty. They have a power and simplicity of the brightest genius. If Jesus were merely some peasant carpenter, from where did this wisdom come from? Jesus is at his best here, but of course he's always at his best. But Jesus will wrap up two commandments. Jesus always uses the right words, the right answer, at the right time. Long ago, and at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. John 26.14 Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear from him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? And then John says, the word became flesh, and he is the astounding eloquence of God, preaching exists primarily to enable the people of God to encounter the living Christ. C.S. Lewis, in his Chronicles of Narnia, was talking to somebody about Aslan, the white lion, Christ and Lucy he portrays. Lord, you're bigger. The answer is, that is because you've grown, my child. Not because you are bigger. I am not. But every year you grow up, you will find me bigger. I think that's true of reading scripture. As we draw closer to the Lord, we realize how big he is, how wise he is. I know that the scripture that I read this morning was very short, but in it is captured the wisdom, the divine wisdom that the Lord speaks to us today. As the work of creation is totally of God, so also is the work of salvation. I was shown this about a week ago when I decided to start reading the Bible anew. And the Bible that I have says to read First Genesis, Genesis 1, and Matthew 1. And then the example, the the reading that I got 
portrayed the creation and then the genealogy of our Savior and made me look at both of them as the works of God himself and even posited the question of which is greater? Is it the creation of the world or the salvation of us? And I sat there and I wandered at it. Wandered at the bigness of God to draw me together back to his word. The cross then shows us that our hell he made his, that his heaven would be made ours. The wisdom of God, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of our wisdom. As we imagine the bigness of this great God, we cannot even fathom it. Yet when we look through a, a telescope to look at the stars, and they just go on and on forever. We think about how big the universe is. A God is bigger than that because he put them in place and named them. So today, we come to Jesus' answer to the Pharisees and his question then to the Pharisees after his answer. He had just had a dialogue with the Sadducees about marriage and the resurrection. And the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. So he is sparring with all these lawyers of the faith, the Jewish faith. A lawyer from the Pharisees wants to trap Jesus into saying something incriminating. And in other words, he is asking Jesus, in your opinion, what is the fundamental promise of the law on which all the individual commandments depend? He is asking then, of all the 613 commands, as later rabbinic tradition would remember them, 248 are positive and 365 are prohibitive. And which command gets all the heart of them all? About 20 years before Jesus, the story is told and that the, the commentator I was reading mentioned the legend was told and it reminded me of the late Dr. Cecil Corbett who always included a legend in his not always but most the time included a legend in his message so here is this legend about 20 years before Jesus a Gentile convert, convert to Judaism approached Rabbi Hillel and asked him to summarize the whole law on standing on one leg. Hillel's answer was a negative version of the golden rule. What you hate for yourself, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. Before and after Jesus, other rabbis used key Bible verses to answer this common question that is being put forth. One quoted Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Another, in Hebrews 2, 4, the righteous shall live by faith. It is in this tradition Jesus is asked, and he will quote from the Torah. His quotes come from Deuteronomy 6, 5, 
in Leviticus 19.15, and it is for us today. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. These two love commandments hang equally on the two pegs. Pegs were used by the Jewish nation for all the commandments so they would have over 600 pegs to put their commandments up. And this is interesting because now they could only have two. The first commandment starts off with the word Shema, which means hear, 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 hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. And it is much like our Apostles' Creed as the oral creed of Christianity, what we believe in. A pious Jew wore this creed upon his forehead and wrist in a tiny little box called a phylactery. At home, the Shema hung on their doors and it was repeated in the morning and evening of every day. Jesus is saying what mattered most was a loving relationship with the one true God that required the whole person, the heart, the soul, and the mind. One translation says heart, soul, and might. And Jesus said heart, soul, and mind. Perhaps the substituted word might mean to their contrived riddles, use your head. <laughs> that even, like I did just now, made me smile. That I could see Jesus telling us, use your head to love the Lord. How do we do that? We become really familiar with the written word. Heart is the hub of the wheel of all our thoughts and our life. It has the job of pumping the life, the blood through our system. The soul represents the seed <coughs> of all our emotional activity. And it is the center of our desires and affections. <clears throat> the mind is the seat and the center of our intellectual life. All, the word all, is repeated three times and it emphasizes the necessity of a total response of love the Lordship of God. <coughs> Here the commentator wrestles with what a lot of ministers think about. We all like sermons that are rosy and cheerful, but all of us need to remember the suffering servant, the passion that Jesus Christ suffered for us. Many of us, me especially, like to tune in to hear Joel Olstein because he is so cheerful in his proclamation and it lifts me up. How does piety distract or remove from the cross and its ugliness? 
I did not say as many of our reformers have, and thanks to them for their reforming. They have gone through a lot of discussions on how ministers should bring the good news to the people. But we must talk about the cross, and that is the love, the love that we are talking about. Thank you, Gwen. The love that we are talking about right here is why we preach the cross. In fact, realizing when the curtain was rent in two, when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, was the very moment that my salvation was very clear and true to me. And I was so happy, I couldn't stop laughing and then crying, then laughing, then crying, because I enjoyed what I had learned from the cross. So the author talks about the piety then that many of us ministers like to do. And this especially is a beautiful day for me because in this small scripture verses that I read, there is so much wisdom that Jesus Christ gives us in these two commandments. The greatest commandment is to be justified by faith alone. Jesus did not say that. He chose to go the route of piety and talk about love. God is love. Our actions and our attitudes and affections are all controlled by love. Love is an all-encompassing all word, isn't it? Love covers over a multitude of sins. So we live for God. We love God, not perfectly, not completely, but totally with our heart, soul, and mind. We are totally, totally depraved, but totally saved. The second part of the answer, Jesus Christ says, the second is like it, like the first part. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he takes this from Leviticus 1918. Jesus quotes all three times in Matthew's Gospel to love your neighbor. Here and in chapter 5, verse 43, and then chapter 19, verse 19. Love encompasses not harboring anger in your heart or seeking vengeance, or bearing a grudge, and frankly reasoning or kindly rebuking our friends if necessary. That's what love is, as it is found in Leviticus. This dialogue was new in Jesus' day. This combination of these two was revolutionary as it was to me as I, as I put this together. I thought they knew, because I've heard it before, and I thought I knew too. James Edwards writes, although the love of God and the love of humanity was occasionally affirmed, separate, affirmed separately in Israel, there is no evidence that before Jesus they were ever combined. It does not appear that any rabbi before Jesus regarded the love of God, neighbor, and self 
as the center and the sum of all the law. We can reco recollect the words at the beginning of this message on the divine power of our Savior's words. He is indeed the Word became flesh. Description of this second commandment should include briefly the mysticism, which is defined as a love for God detached from the love of people. An odd but descriptive example is this. In the days of the Desert Fathers, hermits dedicate their lives extremely to being with God every moment as possible. And they stayed alone. That's why they were hermits. A man called Nathaniel wanted to live his life out like this. A little boy happened to bring his donkey to the door and said it had fallen down and it was hurt and could not travel anymore. The little boy was delivering bread for the church for communion and he was scared to go in the dark because of the hyenas who might attack him and the donkey. He did not want to leave his donkey and he was praying that he could find help and the hermit closed the door. Now, of course, this was what Jesus was talking against because there were a lot of hermits in them our days as John the Baptist was one. He is teaching that a genuine love of God must express itself in a genuine love for neighbors. We don't say stay warm if the person doesn't have a cold. Stay well if the person is sick. Apostle John writes in 1 John 4 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he sees cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from Jesus, whoever loves God must love his brother, has been the most remarkable to me in reading it and looking at it and realizing, although it is short, it encompasses the whole Old Testament commandments. It is so beautiful to realize, and I want to take you back to the first words that I said. We need to pay homage to the words of Jesus Christ. No one ever spoke like him. Jesus spoke simply but with greater wisdom and authority than any other person who walked this earth. The disciples were constantly amazed at what he said. Jesus claims his words and his warnings are immense and they are ringing with power and authority and a majesty. They have that power and simplicity of the highest genius. Jesus was merely some peasant carpenter. From where did this wisdom come from? In the following verses, Jesus will talk about him being the son of David, as he is the son of God. When we think about love that he is talking about, we assured that love covers over a multitude of sins. So these two commandments, actually three, that he puts out to us is so beautiful that we can bask in that love this morning. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, we stand in awe of your word, your living word. As Jesus put forth his answer to the Pharisees who were trying to trap him in some way through his words. And yet he always has the answer, the truth in his answer. We thank you for this brief scripture reading, but out of it radiates his divine counsel to us that we love his Father, our Father, with all our heart, our soul, our might, our mind, and Lord, the second is like it. We love our neighbor as ourselves. How beautiful, how beautiful that is. And when we look back at all the 613 commandments, we can look at these two and know that it is all covered by Jesus. Almost intimidating that in the fulfillment of everything Jesus has done on the cross. Oh my, it is so wonderful to be in your living word and for you to reveal things to us as we read it from time to time. Give us a hunger and thirst that we would want to be in your word all the time. Lord God, go before us that the churches would be, be able to open, that the coronavirus would have to leave in your mighty name as a great physician. And we shout hallelujah that this is coming. We thank you for this Sabbath day you have made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. We say this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. from the book of Hebrews. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to, him, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 